Take care. Right, welcome to this meeting of the Vegetable Council held on the 9th of November. Can we make sure that you switch off your mobiles to silent? Uh, and I think with one exception who is on call. Uh, we'll get most members will be aware of the recent death of the former councillor Arthur Harveston, who served in the authority from 1979 to 2003 and was a mayor in 1991 and 92. Would members please up stand and join me in a minute of silence. Thank you. Please proceed. Right. Item one, apologies for absence. I've got yeah, one from <laughs> Ruth, Clark, Donahue, Quatermain and White. Any more? Yes. Any more? If there's any declaration of interest, uh, members please complete the green form that has been circulated around the meeting. Now, can I ask you to confirm the accuracy of the minutes of the meeting? Any seconder? Any matters arising? Thank you. Right. So I agree then. then. Uh, to note the attendance metric, um, uh, Councillor Wayne. Sorry, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I did. I put it on. I don't know if it's come up there straight away. It was just in relation to the uh, the agenda, the minute from the last meeting, actually. Um, as I don't believe any of the questions were noted down correctly, it just that that's as they were written. Um, but I believe that's not how they were presented at the last meeting. Thank you. Can that be noted, please? Right. Uh, I have some announcements as mayor. Uh, Please can I urge everybody to attend a remembrance service this weekend to pay their respects. As per the, the details sent around by my charities fundraiser, uh, the last one was well attended and raised quite a bit of money. The next two, the tickets on are available for uh, the coming Monday for the Coca Rum. There's a few tickets left if anyone wants to see Jane. Uh, my carol service will be held on Sunday the 10th of December in St. Peter's Church. It will be also recorded by uh, FM radio for to go out on the Christmas Eve. 
I would always like to welcome Cotton Primary pupils and teachers to this meeting and uh, hopefully I'll have a little chat with you after the meeting. We're welcome. Uh, any announcements from the leader? Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Can, can I also welcome uh, a school council, two of the lot more sensible councillors than we are, and, and everybody else in the public gallery. It's great to see people engaged with uh, local government. <coughs> Earlier this week, we had the terrific news that British Steel is to bring steel, steel making back to our borough by ex expanding its operation at Lackenby. The new electric arc furnace will produce steel in a more suitable way, sustainable way, and we will welcome the jobs it will bring to the borough, adding to the excellent work already going on at Lackenby and Skinner Grove. Our heart goes out to those in the country that may lose their jobs, typically Scunthorpe. Councillors here and, and residents will know what it felt like in 2015 to lose 2,000 jobs overnight. Uh, but British Steel have shown huge faith in Red Crane Cleveland, and I would like to congratulate everyone involved in bringing this investment here. We have joined together with the national charity Thrive at Five to introduce additional support to children to ensure they have the best possible start in life. Thrive at Five work with children from birth until the end of their first year of primary school to build a strong foundation to fulfill their potential in future years. The charity support by our council and the Woods Woodsmith Foundation will work with the community in Dormstown, Eston, Grangetown, South Bank and my own ward Kirk Leatham create a localised programme of support. In the longer term, we plan to scale out this early year support in other areas of the borough, including East Cleveland, join our uh, family hub programme. Once again, our staff have worked hard to keep the public safe. The work accumulated in magistrates ordering an Eston shop and the flat above to be closed for three months for storing and selling illicit tobacco and illegal vapes to customers. This is another example, th this time through enforcement, of how we can make a pos pos positive difference to our residents on a daily basis. And speaking of making a positive difference, I would like to add my praise of our 10-year-old Joe Couples, who started litter picking when he was nine near his home in Dormans Town. South Gare, and he <laughs> sounds like a remarkable young man. His work was recognised with a treat from Rick of Fire Brigade and a reception with the Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I would like to thank them for taking the time to recognise his considerable achievements. Thank you. Any announcements from Cabinet members? I don't notice. Anything announcements from the Managing Director? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a reminder to all members that we have a, a second all members conference next week on the 14th of November at one o'clock in this chamber. You are all invited, so please be there if you can. It will be a feedback session on the last session, so further discussions on proposals where I think we have received some mixed uh, views and also a strategic look at our asset portfolio. The intention is to get the agenda to you tomorrow along with that feedback that you, you have so you can bring that along on Tuesday as well. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. There's no questions from the public, so I'm going to move on to the uh, reports from the Cabinet and Cabinet Committees. The mover, I must remind you, is 10 minutes to speak, the second of five minutes, and the mover can then speak for further five minutes. The first one is from Councillor Leroy to Councillor Hart. Councillor Leroy. Uh, yeah, I would like to move the report, and um, and I believe that Councillor Hart is seconding and reserving the right to speak. Okay. Okay. Yeah, this this change is rather minimal. Uh, there may be concerns in certain parts that this will give all-encompassing powers to the chair of planning but it doesn't so it's a very small change and I, I'll elucidate why in a moment 
So in section 160 of the existing delegated powers uh, and the constitution, I'm leaving parts A, B, C, D, E and F with no change. It's just an extra check and balance that I'm putting in there. Uh, and it would be prior to issuing a delegated decision. So a delegated decision is where the officer, uh, a planning officer can sign off um, any, uh, any planning agreement or planning proposal. And I'm wanting just to put a check and balance in there from the chair and vice chair regulatory committee, which will be able to notify within seven days via email uh, to be able to bring forward delegated decisions to the regulatory committee. So this is not for the decision of the chair or the vice chair, it would come to the regulatory committee. So there's no way of, uh, of gerrymandering a process for either of those individuals, the vice chair or the chair themselves. And it's very specific in the types of um, decision that could or proposal that could then be brought to committee. So it would have a site area of more than five acres, so it's substantial. We'd have a floor space of greater than 7,500 quadratic metres, and it would create more than 150 residential units. Now, the reason for doing this is that council officers work to plan in law, and they work to the policy that's laid down in front of them. But we as councillors form the policy, and we know what's good for our community. Now, this would affect, to give you an idea, seven decisions over the last eight years I looked at where I thought I would have probably have called that in as chair. So it's seven. So this is not a substantial amount of work. It's not a big change. What it enables us to do is to what I would say have a second bite at an application. And what I mean by that is that we have a, a fortunate history here of not producing enough council housing, not producing enough affordable housing, not having an improved electronic and digital infrastructure, lack of vertical farming, for example, uh, poor ecology, um, carbon neutral developments of vertically non well, non-existent. And then a, another point as well is that we have 1960s infrastructure. So when these large developments come forward, they're relying on roads from the 60s, electrical networks from the 60s, often they're with gas central heating systems that we wouldn't appreciate, of course, where we are now. So this gives an opportunity and of course what can happen here is that an individual from the council can approach either the chair or vice chair to call in a proposal which would have been signed off under delegated matters to be able to discuss these elements for us to be able to shape our communities in a more efficient manner than we've been able to do thus far <coughs> and that's all there is to it Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor so I will op open up for any debate on that point or any questions Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Nee Wright. Uh, the, the first thing that springs to mind, did you say seven? Uh, seven that would you, you, you would have called in instances. I'm just wondering what time period that would have been over. And the planning, the planning is paying for these slower times, and the, the, like, things like Tees Works and British Steel and things like that, we, we, we'll need to move along as it's a fast timeline. Can, can you just ensure me this won't delay and clog up the planning committee and the, and the procedures moving forward, please? Councillor Leroy. Yeah, it was seven. So when I went back through Sorry. the. Do you want me to do a question and answer? I'd come back at the end and sum up, correct? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for the report. Just to check on the criteria themselves, um, there's an or after the second one, which makes it read as if it's got to be five hectares and then either seven and a half thousand square metres or. Um, 150 residential units. Is that or in the wrong place? Is it just one of those three that it has to fulfil? And, and secondly, um, the report tells us of a financial and a legal risk to the council, but it doesn't say how, it's gonna, how they're going to be mitigated. Normally when we get told about risks, we get told what the council's going to do to mitigate the risks. Thank you. Members have over planning uh, agreements or refusals, the better. And I think, in my 
quite a long career as a councillor, I can remember, probably Glyn can as well, when every decision, every planning decision went to committee. Some of them took five seconds to deal with, but they still went to committee. And of course, you did have the option to uh, uh, extend that five seconds if <coughs> you so wished to talk about it. I, I wouldn't l want to go back to that, but we are the councillors. Major decisions should be taken by councillors. And, and certainly from what has been said, these are quite large decisions which are going to affect the public as a whole. And so um, on those grounds, uh, you know, I can see no objection to this. And I think the more councillors are involved and the less officers are involved, the better as far as I'm concerned. Although that's not to undermine <laughs> officers. I respect their advice, but we should have the last word, particularly on momentous applications. Thank you, Councillor Kay. Councillor Carolyn Kay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I agree with the previous um, speaker. Reading the report, um, the impact and therefore the risks um, to the council do appear difficult to determine, although they do appear to perhaps potentially be significant, especially on our statutory timescales for dealing with planning applications. So just that worries me a little bit. Thank you. Uh, count Sorry, uh, but it should be Councillor Pallas to ask for it first. Uh, um, we, we discussed the, the report and the recommendations at the Regulatory Committee, and there was a couple of points raised. One, that members can already call in delegated decisions now, if they wish to, on planning matters, planning applications, and residents, five or more residents from different addresses can also call in a planning application that's been, regardless of whether it's a delegated authority. Um, I do think we have to be careful and monitor the risks to our performance and the financial risks. And I think in terms of the chair and vice chair, I think it should just come, if council agree, if the uh, proposal um, to change one, 106, uh, sorry, 160 um, of the plan and powers delegated authority, then I think then it should go straight to the plan and regulatory committee, not just the, the chair and vice chair. The, the issue, I suppose, is, is do we trust our, our officers as well and I think we've got to have in anything we do the trust and mutual respect for officers and officers and members to be able to work together and do and have good relationships. But having said that, I think many of us in this room will door knock regularly and be told that we don't trust our politicians anymore. We don't believe that you listen to us and you know we only have to see the COVID scandal at the moment and we can see why there's so much mistrust in politicians. So I think as members we do have to be mindful that we are the elected representatives and the decisions that we make, what impact that will have on people and communities' lives. So for that reason, book stops with us, the decisions that we make stops with us. Um, so I, for that reason, I will be happy to promote, propose, uh, sorry, I will be happy to support the proposed amendments to power 160 of the constitution. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Philip Thompson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, members have expressed concern about uh, potential delays uh, and potential financial uh, risks associated with this uh, proposal. 
I think these fears can uh, concerns can be allayed. Uh, the department has made an estimate of the number of potential uh, extra applications that might come per annum before regulatory. And that number is between 10 and 11. I do not think that that extra work on the regulatory committee would be onerous nor provide unnecessary time consumption. Members may not be aware that regulatory is sometimes cancelled because of <coughs> lack of business. Members may not be aware that regulatory committee frequently finishes after one hour of deliberation. So any concerns, I think, uh, are mislaid. As far as call-in is concerned, in order for call-in to be really effective, every member needs to be on the ball every day to make sure that the time limit for calling in is complied with. So although that facility does exist, it is not a foolproof system. So I am supportive of this uh, proposal, and I hope that all our members will respect the right of members to have as great, as realistic input as they are able to do within the planning system. Thank you. I have two more councillors wishing to speak, uh, and I won't we'll take no more after that. Uh, Councillor Stuart Smith. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, like Councillor Pallister, uh, I did have concerns in relation to timescales and um, whether the local authority would be able to uh, keep within them and also uh, the additional possible work uh, for our offices. Can I just remind councillors that uh, the staff that uh, are on the planning team are greatly reduced to what they used to be. But uh, having spoken with uh, Councillor Leroy the other day, we had a good chat uh, and he reassured me uh, in some of the proposals that he's wanted to bring in in relation to this. Um, and it will deal with one issue that uh, the Saltburn Ward councillors had a few years ago where, um, if you recall, uh, the new estate, Taylor Wimpy, was being built on the outskirts and as soon as you leave Saltburn it became, it was at that time, St Germain's Ward and it was very difficult for Saltburn Ward councillors to get any sort of information or to be kept up to date in relation to that. This, uh, these proposals will, will deal with that so uh, I do support uh, what uh, Councillor Leroy is trying to achieve here. Thank you Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. The last person to speak is Councillor Wayne Davis. Why, uh, when councillors have the right to call in, if you're if you're on board, if you're if you're switched on in your ward, if it's in your ward, you tend to to know these things anyway. And if you want to call things in, you'll want to call it in. Um, but I think the more I've uh, found out about it, it seems to be more for the bigger things. Um, so I, I would be more inclined to say if it's if it's a if it's a big planning application, um, it should automatically be coming to committee. And I think Councillor Pallister sort of hit it a little bit on the head anyway. Why don't we just change it slightly to say anything of them that meets any of them criteria just automatically goes to committee, and then it can all be discussed, and anyone can go on as long as they want to. Um, but you know. I've got no problems with it, um, and I don't actually think um, that you know it'll cause much issue in terms of timings. Because, like you say, I think any the chair or the vice chair of that committee could call a, 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 an extraordinary planning meeting if needs be. Um, so, in terms of timing, timings can always be uh, uh, facilitated to, to make sure that they're done. Um, so, yeah. So, apart from saying that it could all go to committee if it meets any of that criteria, I've got no problems with it at all. I think I've changed my mind on it over the last couple of weeks. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Leroy, to sum up. There we go. All right. 
Yeah, thank you very much for the considered comments. Uh, just to deal with a couple of questions. I had it seven over eight years that I, when I'm going back through the reports, I personally worked on. But I know that Officer um, Carter had that between 10 and 11, 10 a year. Um, but my obviously my threshold was a, a lot higher in that instance. Um, the question is, yeah, it's one of the three. So there's a comma and then there's an or. Um, to Councillor Hannaway's question. The financial risk, uh, I'd assume to be um, minimal, and that comes to uh, Councillor Davies' point and Councillor Thompson's point on, in terms of the volume of work that came through the committee. Uh, I noted Councillor Kay's point as well. Thank you for his, his input um, on that and his experience over the years. Um, it, it allows a closer view of delegated decisions as well. Now, um, one of the privileges of being chair is that you get to obviously work with planning as you go along, you will see things, it's an opportunity to then flag those with ward councillors and then to have more discussion uh, thereof. Uh, and to Councillor Smith's point, the exact in intention of this is that you wouldn't be not normally notified if you were on the border of a development and the development was taking place in the neighbouring ward, where using this mechanism it allows those ward councillors to have a say as well. Um, so therefore, um, I, uh, I propose and I move the uh, agenda item. Right, can I have a vote in favour? Second with Council Hall. Right. It is carried. Right, can I, before I move on, can I bring up a, a little bit of uh, on a protocol? It is not uh, ethical to wear a cap in the chamber, so can I ask the council to remove it, please? <laughs> Thank you. The next point, I'd like Councillor Pallister and the Leeds to, to split this two into two debate reports, please. Is that okay with you? I think they run, they, they uh, run into each other. Two, two recommendations. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's fine, yeah. Right. Thank you. Okay, if we can discuss the first recommendation, three. Uh, by Councillor Pallister and, and seconded by the Leader. This is the, for the approval of 1.6 million for the Eston Swing Path. Uh, and I'm we'll come back to the other one. Both or, uh, sorry, did I use that phrase? You asked if the Leader was recommending. Or seconding, sorry. Sorry, my ears are really bad. <laughs> Right, thanks, Mr. Mayor. So in 2021, the Cabinet agreed the development of an outline business case for a replacement 25 metre six lane swimming pool in the Greater Eston area of the borough. Earlier this year, as part of the process, public consultation was undertaken on the proposals. Following the results of the feedback, there was widespread view we need to bring the pool back to its original design include a learner pool. Greater Eston has a population of just under 40,000, with some wards suffering some of the worst health outcomes, not only within the borough, but across the UK. A particular area of concern is lack of physical activity in children, leading to higher rates of obesity at year six. Eston, Normanby, Teesville, Grangetown and Southbank are all in the top 10 in our borough for childhood obesity. Grangetown and Southbank also have very low car ownership and rely often on public, poor public transport to get to Redcar or Middlesbrough swimming baths. Studies carried out by Sports England revealed one of the reasons for lack of participation in sport and activities was travel costs. 
report presented to council today recommends that we cease the current proposals and design a new scheme incorporating a separate learner pool the first of its kind in the borough to allow neurodivergent new sorry neurodivergent children the opportunity to enjoy swim sessions in a safe calming space and building a new pool that includes a learner pool within walking distance of some of our, our most disadvantaged communities. It lets the people of Redcorn Cleveland know that we've listened to them, particularly in the Greater Essen area, and that Redcorn Cleveland are building a swimming pool that's inclusive, that everyone can enjoy. I'm going to move the recommendations, and the first recommendation Council is to agree the Borough Council that approve the allocation of an additional 1.6 million of prudential borrowing to the Espen Pool Scheme set out in Table 4 of the report. The second recommendation is to approve the relocation of half a million of funding from Hurl and Shaw Scheme to support grassroots sports. Can I pause you there because you're going on the second part of your application? We'll come back to that one. Right. So the, fir the first recommendation is to re is to agree the extra bor borrowing as detailed in recommendation three, page seventeen. The second is. Yep. Your second ready to go. Right, Craig Anaway. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. If you had a friend who wanted to put an extension on their house and they had to take on extra borrowing to do it, but they also told you that they weren't sure they'd be able to meet all their outgoings over the next few years, would you advise them to take on that extra borrowing for the extension? I kept saying it to myself, seven million pounds for a learner pool. I was hoping if I kept saying it, it would sound more sensible. But I think at this time, unfortunately, it isn't. There's something, I mean, your heart's obviously in the right place. It, it would be it, an almost heroic decision, really. You know, that whatever happens, um, whatever trouble it causes the council, you know, this, this is going to happen. But I'm not sure that, that the parents of the children who would use it would thank you for having to say increase their council tax um, in the light of this decision. I mean, we need to consider all of the things that the council's going to have to pay for in the next few years. If we look, we start with the number of looked after children, which is now over 400. We were told in a previous report the average cost for each of them was over 300,000 pounds. And of course, that's an average cost. Um, and those costs at any moment I noticed in the corporate parenting update that there is unfortunately a, a care leaver who is currently detained in hospital. And when I saw that, it really rang some alarm bells because it reminded me of a very similar situation in 2018 where a young person was detained in hospital because they were at risk of self-harm. And the hospital said they could not provide the necessary safety for that young person. And so children's services had to look for a placement. And there wasn't one in this country because the demand on placements is extremely high and they're extremely expensive because the Home Office stopped funding them as they used to. And so eventually this young person went to Scotland. We had to pay for the place the Scottish barrister because Scottish law is different and pay for the transport costs of the social workers to go to Scotland, their family members to go to Scotland, and all of the accommodation. Um, it quickly got to somewhere near a million pounds. Um, it is staggering what the costs and the risks of costs are that we will face if we take other items like the homeschool transport, four and a half million. The plan to get that to come down involves gaining the trust of parents 
so they don't feel the need to apply for an EHCP. Is that likely? Is that likely in coming years with the, um, the disrespect for authority, the distrust for authority there is at the moment? So I can't see any expectation that the 10 million overspend the children's services will, will be able to spend any less this year. And I think in that environment, um, this is a, a very risky thing to do. Uh, we know that universal services do lose out because of the serious social need we have to meet. There isn't very much that we can do about that, unfortunately. I think it would be far, far cheaper to subsidize the uh, bus journeys of families to either the Neptune Center or to Redcar. I don't think the children care which borough they're learning to swim in. Uh, I think this is just really the wrong time uh, to take on this extra borrowing. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Steve Pig. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, to pick up where Craig left off, it is the wrong time. And I think this poll is leading this authority into a black hole financially. We just cannot afford it. You know, th there is a limit to what we can afford. And we've, al we've already come up to the event horizon, which is our limit, at 11 million. You want to put it up to 19 million, it'll be 25 million before you finish it. It's absolutely ridiculous. And what, you, you know, it's all right thinking of the benefits it's going to give the public. But you've got to think of two other things. One is the effect on the council tax. Even if we don't go bust like other authorities and have to close pools to save money. And furthermore, we have social deprivation in other parts of the borough, like the medium-sized villages like Lingdale and Bratton in East Cleveland. That's where your socialism should be going, not all concentrated on South Bank and Grangetown area. You know, to my mind, you've got it all wrong. The, we started off, by the way, before 2019, your, your party left the pool unused for years on end, and, the, and, and even when it came back into use, the paddling pool, sorry, the learner pool wasn't used at all. And in fact, it was even considered to put the boilers into the learner pool. People aren't that, but if you go around and say to people in that area, do you want a learner pool? Everybody's gonna say yes. But if you say, do you want a learner pool and a large amount added to your council tax to pay for it, they'd say no. You've got to give them the full picture when you were considering these matters. So, uh, you know, Sue Jeffrey, a ghost is still hanging over you. She went on and on and on about this learner pool. When people don't really need it, the swimming, the swimming, the, the, the swimming club don't want it even. They're quite happy with uh, cordoning the end of the, pool, of the proposed pool off. And I'm saying to you, follow the plan that we devised it's down, I think, costed at 11 million. Most of that's covered up by, covered by uh, leveling up money. And you can have a good pool, a decent pool, a thousand times better than what we had before. And everybody can be moderately satisfied. As, as we all know, you can't have every, everything in life. You, you know, when it comes to Christmas Day, you may not get your Rolls Royce. You may have to deal with a Ford like me. You know, think of the pool in that way. It's b what's gonna, what we wanted to put there is better than anything that's been there before. And that's the plan you should stick to. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor uh, Alec Brown. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Let's first of all, I know you like aliens and black holes. Let's talk about black holes. Let's talk about the 2.5 million pound black holes. Your administration, with you as part of the cabinet, left in the budget that we've inherited. The seven to 10 million pound overspend that we inherited, Councillor, 
from 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 from, from can let, I, let me finish i haven't finished can yet. i i haven't finished that we inherited from from your administration we're not going to leave a black hole the seven million pound overspend that we inherited is down to 4.2 and we'll be in the next in the next uh, quarter two uh financial report uh, that comes to cabinet we made considerable lengths at uh, cutting putting that overspend down in in terms of moving forward we it's not a heroic councillor hanway unfortunately this friend this new friend is good with his pocket money a lot better than his old friend okay and you can be rest assured that if we weren't confident that we were within the next two years we'll be forced to balance budgets without an overspend we would simply wouldn't be doing it okay so it's not heroic it's done with with months and months of hard work and, and working a ballot uh, working a, a budget so we can move forward okay now two thousand people in tier six think that a swimming pool, a learning pool would benefit them. As far as travelling to Redcar, you want to go and get, try and get in that learning pool right now? It's jam packed. It's jam packed virtually every single day. As someone who's took his little girl learned to swim in that learning pool, and it's always, always full. Okay? So the dire need in tier six for a learning pool is apparent. Not a splash pool, which I've seen mentioned. However, that would still benefit the, 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 the swimming pool. However, it's not a learner pool. And also, which I found out in, in this journey, was the neurodiverse angle. They've simply got nowhere to go to learn to swim, unless it's coming to Redcar, if they live in that region. So that, so therefore, just to, just to answer, I'm more than happy as leader to put, to put our name to this learner pool, because it's simply not the, 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 the financial mismanagement you suggest. In fact, it's being built on the back of a really, really, really good financial management. Like I say, in quarter two, you're going to see that overspend come down considerably that we inherited. That was with the 2.5 billion black hole. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Pugh. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I didn't expect this debate to be so passionate. I thought we'd settled the argument that actually children in TS6 do deserve a swim pool in TS6 that they can learn to swim at. Um, all I want to say really is we support a second pool at Essendon Baths, whether that's a learner pool, Councillor Brown mentioned a splash pool there, we would back that too, but the plan is a learner pool, okay. Um, to increase borrowing, the independents are right to point out that that's not fantastic, we do have an overspend, but to withdraw, you know, and to, with, to withdraw investment from the Hurling Shaw scheme too, which I know is the next part of, uh, part of this, that's not fantastic either. So we would just ask, we will be, um, we will be back in Labour on this one, but we'd ask that the council look at reprofiling the level up fund bid uh, so we can reallocate money from the active travel to the baths. That's not to end the active travel because it's really, really important, but to reallocate some funding to try and offset borrowing. Uh, that's what we'd like you to do. Thanks very much. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor uh, Cawley. Yeah, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, <laughs> While Councillor Hannaway pointed out about the borrowing with your home, I know families that have had to borrow to provide a sanction for their children that do have neurodiverse issues. So we all know through COVID it has caused a spike with neurodiverse in our children and CAMS can't cope with the numbers now. So the waiting list at the moment to be assessed for neurodiverse is 18 months to two years. That is going to be growing to two to two and a half years. Now, at the moment, children with neurodiverse, as you say, have to go to red car. Um, but that's at unsociable hours. Why is it that children with neurodiverse are always put at the bottom of the pile? It's about time, and I'm glad that Councillor Pallister is putting them at the top because it's about time there was change in the way that people <laughs> think and our children deserve better. Thank you. Thank you. I have four more speakers on this. I won't take any more after these four. Uh, Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I have a concern there. I just heard from Councillor Pugh in terms of the reallocation of active travel funds. 
Correct. So that's almost taking from one part of the borough to deliver in another part of the borough. By nature, by nature, it being active travel, the location relocation from one place to another part of the borough. So the other the other question I've got is yeah, extra borrowing. This this isn't great. And then questionable in terms of the the need, the desire for the pool as outlined, maybe there, but the actual need, and we're in a need situation where we don't have enough money going around. So I, I also have a, a real concern over this capital project war that's taking place, and it's taking place in TS6, and all of the concentrations there, and we're going into an election year, and you've got red versus blue, both naturally in support of what's happening in TS6, neglecting the rest of the borough, I think this is more about politics and less about a pool. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Julia Hart. Thank you. Um, whilst I absolutely don't begrudge uh, the Burns of Eston and surrounding areas a pool or two pools, um, I am also conscious about the money. Um, um, I just want to make two points to uh, Councillor Brown. Um, you know, I can see that it's important to you that 2,000 people signed that petition that they wanted that pool. 2,000 people signed the position, petition for free parking in Gisborough and they were ignored. If we can get this pool up and going for Eston, is Gisborough going to be next on the list so we're not using our 60-year-old pool for our children? Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Councillor, your two thousand residents weren't weren't ignored in uh, in 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 Gisborough by yourselves. This council passed a motion to send that petition to the mayor for election, and I think it got ignored there. So I apologise, but we. Ignore it. The full council passed a motion. Councillor Bill's bill oh. Do I have to press anything? No. Uh, I'm just a little bit concerned that with some of the earlier speakers, that there's a bit of confusion between capital and revenue expen expenditure. You know, the pressure's on the revenue budget, and uh, this is a capital project. And uh, what, I can't remember who said it, but somebody's saying about busing people to other parts of the borough, well, that would be a revenue cost. You know, and that could perhaps cost more than the prudential borrowing would cost. You know, we've got to, be, we've got to remember this is a capital project. That's the point I want to make. Thanks. Thank you. I, I did say that after ca Councillor Van, I was uh, not accepting any more uh, speakers. So Councillor Van's the last speaker on this. to Mr Mayor, the last meeting finished after an hour and 20 minutes, so I think we've got plenty of time unless there's something on the agenda that no one's told me that's going to go on much longer than probably four o'clock. <laughs> anyway, uh, just to move into the point, Mr Mayor. Right, if they take if they take it as uh, as read, they will get through the questions much quicker. Um, so just a couple of quick, very quick points, Mr. Mayor. Um, as black holes get get mentioned from the last administration, um, so obviously I just wanted to pick up on that. Councillor Davis, can I ask you to sit down because Councillor Van was our next speaker. You asked me to stand up, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Councillor Van was on before you were. Right. Oh. I'll give way. I think as a father to a, a neurodivergent child, I think one of the things that you come up against constantly is a lack of social infrastructure and investment in services for those 
for those adults and children uh, who suffer from neurodivergency. And I think to kind of, to kind of, well, some of the comments today have perhaps suggested that those kids should just suck it up and use the facilities that are available, which aren't geared towards people who see the world in the way that they see the world. And I think this investment is not just in terms of, is this a learner pool, is it 1.6 million? It's an investment into a, s a section of society that often gets forgotten, and I think we should all um, you know, take heed of that when we're making these decisions. Right, that was the last speaker. I'm going back to Lynn Pallister now to sum up. Sorry, sorry, Councillor Davis, I'd ask you to sit down because I did announce before I was taking no more speakers after uh, the you All right, I'll accept, I'll, ac I'll accept it on this occasion, but keep it short, please. <laughs> right, so, Black Holes. I was at Black Holes, and then I got sat down. Right, so, we all know that every administration blames the last administration for Black Holes. I think I was one of them that did it when we had the 8.9 million from the Wall Garden in the last one. But anyway, we'll forget Black Holes. Uh, I think we all know that the reason for the black holes in the council's budget is all down to inflation mainly and an, over an oversight on uh, the children's and adult services costs that keep going through the roof. Anyway, but we have left more money in reserves as, uh, as my honourable friend just in front of me said, uh, he always put money away, so hopefully there's money in the clock somewhere. Um, but just in answer as well to Councillor Bill Suthers, I think he's still here. Um, can just gone out, what a shame. because. Uh, he mentioned that uh, this, uh, there's a difference between revenue and capital, but what he's probably failed to realise is that when you're repaying your loans, it comes out of your revenue budget. So, uh, uh, obviously, I'm glad that at least some people in the room know what goes on when it comes to finances. Um, but, yeah, just to point out as well, I, I did get mentioned, and I think it's completely right what uh, Mr. Uh, Councillor Leroy said, this is definitely a political decision. And it's a political decision, and I'll tell you why, Mr. Mayor, because when it came to Cabinet, there was no officer recommendation, and that's what stood out to me, because the officers definitely do not want this to happen because they know it's going to cause problems for the council in years to come. Right. Can I ask now Councillor Pallister to sum up, please? Um, I think I'll start with Councillor Kay's point, and I think it's very, very sad that we have so many disadvantaged communities mm children in our wards. We're all pleased that we get capital funding and the nice shiny buildings and that's great but we do need more funding for prevention because as as we've heard from Councillor Annaway, you know, there's real serious issues in our children's services and we need more money in prevention. So I think sometimes it's sad to say well our communities disadvantage as well. Yeah, we've got far too many communities across Redford and Cleveland that need help. Sue Jeffries, you said about about what we did or we didn't do for, for the BATS when we were in administration. We did put some funding into there to maintain um, the BATS and, and I agree it needed investment, real investment, which is coming now, thankfully. But we lost the administration, and before we lost the administration, we had meetings in Eston Leisure Centre with the leader of the council, Sue Jeffries, and others to discuss the funding for a new pool. Unfortunately, we lost the council, but thankfully, the new administration has offer, did offer to put funding in for a new pool. We're just asking that it's brought back to what people want, and that's to include a learner pool. Um, Councillor Pugh talked about looking at different funding. We are doing that. 
we hope not to have to borrow 1.6 million but we have to come to the council and ask that question for you to agree that at the moment we will be looking at a business case and we are definitely looking at how we can find the other 1.6 million I think Councillor Corley and Neil made some real excellent comments about how we need to support our children with special needs and this is one way that we can do it because although I think Red Cabaths do provide some support for neurodivergent children, it's as what was said, it's only certain hours. Councillor Leroy and um, sorry, Wayne <laughs> said um, that this is political. No, it's not political. It's what it's what the people of Greater Reston. There's nearly forty thousand residents in Greater Reston, so they deserve a pool and they deserve a good pool. They deserve a pool that can support children with special needs. There's lots of poverty, as you know that, Councillor Leroy, and I think the best thing that we can do in terms of supporting people that can't afford buses, which that's if we can get one. We need better transport, improving health, mental health, then that's why we're doing it, not political. And when we promise something, we try and deliver it. And I think one of the other issues was mentioned was 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 obviously I, I appreciate the, the, the issues we've got with our budgets. I mean a ten million overspend. The black hole is children's services and we do need to sort that out. There's there's no doubt about it. We can't go on like this. But to just deprive Greater Reston of a of a learner pool solving that issue that is the issue you know if we can solve the 10 million overspend and that's gone on year after year after year then we probably wouldn't be coming to this council talking about how can we borrow 1.6 million and pay for it hopefully we don't have to take it from the council budget and we find it in another budget um, so I recommend it recommend um, to the council sorry I've lost a bit that we borrow as detailed, page three, 1.6 million, confidential borrowing, and I'll move that recommendation first and then go on to the second recommendation. Thanks, Councillor. We're now going to vote on acceptance of, of the 1.6 million. Uh, and a man's up who wants a recording vote. Right, will I have a recording vote? Hmm. I'll pass up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm going to go through the list and call out your name. I'm looking for a four against or abstain. Uh, you're voting for at the approval of 1.6 million additional borrowing. If I miss you out, I will come back to you so I can record your vote. Starting with Councillor Atwood. Councillor Belshaw. Councillor Bendelow. Councillor Berry. Councillor Brown. Councillor Corley. Councillor Cheney. Councillor Clark R. Councillor Clark B. Yeah. Councillor Craven. Councillor Kerr. Yeah. Councillor Cutler. Yeah. Councillor Davies. Yeah. Councillor Earl. Yeah. Councillor Evans. Yeah. Councillor Fairley. Yeah. Councillor Fletcher. Yeah. Councillor Gray. Yeah. Councillor Grogan. Councillor Hannaway, yeah. Councillor Hargreaves, yeah. Councillor Hart I, yeah. Councillor Hart J, yeah. Councillor Head, yeah. Councillor Hunt, yeah. Councillor Jeffrey, yeah. Councillor, 
Councillor Jones, Councillor Joy, Councillor Kay, Councillor King, Councillor Levin, Councillor Leroyd, Councillor Martin, Councillor Massey, Councillor McHugh, Councillor McInnes, Councillor Morgan, Councillor Meyer, Councillor Neil, Councillor Nightingale, Councillor Oliver, Councillor Ovens, Councillor Pallister, Councillor Powley, Councillor Pugh, Councillor Richardson, Councillor Ryder, Councillor Rin, Councillor Salvin, Councillor Smith, Councillor Southers, Councillor Simmon, Councillor Taylor, Councillor Thompson J, Councillor Thompson P. Thank you. Chief, please bear with me while I add them up. Right, uh, that was carried. We have 32 for, 17 against, and 5 abstain, so the motion was carried. Yeah. Right, I'd like to go to recommendation number 2 from, from Lynn Pallister again. Re recommendation number 2, uh, Councillor uh, Pallister. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Second recommendation in the report is to approve the reallocation of half a million of funding from the Harland Shaw scheme to support grassroots sport. Seconder, please. Any, any, any? Reserve the right. Reserve the right. Okay. Along, okay. Unfortunately, sorry. Right. Anybody wish to speak? I've nobody wish to speak, so. So, Councillor Palace would sum up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I've, I've just wrote a little bit about why I think we should do this. And in Redcorn Cleveland, we've got over 100 different clubs sports organisations and each of them support anything between 20, 30 children up to 400 a week. That's a week. So we're looking at probably about, and I haven't done the maths, we're at least about 11,000 children are getting involved in sport and that's mainly with volunteer led coaches. So grassroots sport clubs are at the heart of the local communities we represent. They have a significant impact in the community way beyond the physical activity itself. We see lots of young children, young people now with far more issues in terms of mental health and obviously we've mentioned obesity and sitting on computers. So the more we can get 
children and young people involved in grassroots sports the better so you know taking part in sport and physical activity makes fe people feel happier healthier and it builds confidence resilience discipline and so it also has the power to, to bring communities together. So obviously you've got the coaches, you've got the, the parents coming, you've got the children, young people taking part. It becomes bigger than, than sport itself. People start to socialise more as well. Being active has huge benefits to individuals and local communities. And research tells us that people who take part or volunteer have 10% higher self-esteem, emotional well-being, I've already said resilience. The many clubs who have their own facilities do not just deal with sport, they also offer employment opportunities and other community services. But we are finding that clubs, as much as they try and do well for the children and young people, sometimes deserve or need a little bit more support financially so what we think this half million will do will actually lever in more than our obviously match funding this is only the start of it and we can start being the borough as i said in the last report that's inclusive for all children and young people and we provide the best opportunity in terms of sport and activities we can thank you mr mayor Sorry, Councillor Brown, you cannot come in because we have a round up. Now, that's after summing up. Please never indicated. So, can we go to a vote, please? That came on after me summing up, so. Do you want, can we go to a vote to accept? Can I have a vote to accept the recommendations, please? It's carried. Right, can I now come on to uh, the Cabinet report, Councillor C, for Councillor Massey to move Agenda 8, 8C. And I believe the Leader is seconded it. Yes, uh, thanks for this. I'm going to uh, move the report, then speak a bit. I think Councillor Brown's going to second the report, so we'll do that now, Councillor Brown. <laughs> and he reserves the right to speak. Um, right, so members will be aware of this because it's been through the Governance Committee twice, Resources Scrutiny once and Cabinet once, but the ultimate decision maker is full council, which is why it's here today, because it affects terms, conditions, and also affects to some extent the constitution. So there are three parts of the recommend, well, there are two parts of the recommendation, but there's three parts of different sets of policies we have to change. So there's the protocol on member officer relations, and I'll speak about a bit of an amendment that we're proposing to that, which comes from Councillor Thompson that the Cabinet accepted. The second part is the officer's code of conduct and the third part is the arrangements for handling code of conduct complaints. So members on the governance committee will be well aware this has done the rounds quite a bit and the initial idea about changing um, some of these policies comes from an internal audit report by Veritao and this said that the council should try and clarify a few arrangements particularly um, our member officer relations because some of the language that was used was a bit out of date. There's also within this changes to handling code of conduct complaints. Obviously for members who were here prior to the last set of elections will be aware that we had a few of these last time around. And so a couple of recommendations are made. One is that a hearing panel in the future can recommend to the full council that a leader be removed from office. Just because in the past the recommendation was to recommend to the leader. Whereas the idea now is that if it is the leader who might fall foul of a code of conduct complaint, the hearing panel can recommend to full council that the leader be discharged from their duties and it's a full council decision at that point. The second major change is that a censure in future could be handed down by the panel as opposed to all 59 councillors. What we found last time was that a number of members worked really closely on a particular issue but then the decision was given over to all members who hadn't worked as closely on it so we're trying to tighten that up to give 
panel a bit more power and the panel I think is going to try and increase in number if possible to five from three. And finally, it's suggested that the monitoring officer in consultation with the independent member, not independent councillor, but we have independent members on these boards, um, can filter out some of the more minor complaints before referring any serious matters to an assessment subcommittee. All decisions will be reported to the Governance Committee come what may. I think that our code of conduct complaints in this administration, not thing to do with us, to do with all of us, have calmed down a little. But last time around, there was an awful lot of workload, I think, for both council staff and the members on that subcommittee, so that's the change there. So going back to the officer's code of conduct, that's in the pack and it's getting discussed with our trade unions. And then finally, going back to member officer relations, you will note that in the recommendation in your cabinet, sorry, your full council pack from the cabinet, that there is a recommendation that we accept an amendment. So the cabinet previously accepted this and it was an amendment that came from councillor Thompson that just clarifies how members may seek to deal with officers. So the initial suggestion was the members' inquiry system should be for all inquiries. And although I think that personally is probably correct for most, there will be a time clearly when members have to speak directly to officers. And Councillor Thompson's amendment, I think, reflects that. So the Cabinet accepted it. And that's what being, is being proposed now. So I move the report and take questions at the end. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Councillor Brown. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, just, just to touch on uh, Councillor Massey, there was 83 code of conduct complaints in the last four years. Uh, we're pussycats and we're working a lot more closely together uh, so far, so long may it continue. And, and thank you everybody for the professional way we're, we're getting business done. Uh, I, think, I think the important bit of this is, is the panel and the leader. Uh, we, wanted, we, we wanted to make sure there was no politics involved. So for instance, if I ever got a code of conduct or a future, uh, a future leader, then the political party, the reign or group, couldn't then just sort of segment around them uh, to, to make the panel irrelevant. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the previous one. We, we, we discussed this or the person involved. However, the panel, they worked tirelessly for over a year to the point where one or two of them were having sleepless nights and really upset to it. Then we got to this chamber and then it just became a, the, the, the factual side of, of the issue didn't matter anymore. It was, it was who was friends with who and it went with the vote and that's not right. So that's what this uh, report hopes to avoid in the future moving forward. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Glenn Nightingale. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I wasn't at the Cabinet meeting, but I'm sure that Councillor Gray was able to pass on the information that was discussed at the Resources Committee. I just want to make four points though. Uh, we all know, well, five actually. Um, we all know the background to this and the need for this, and I would certainly support <coughs> it. And, and certainly the Resources Committee uh, did that. But they wanted to make uh, at least three points, and I want to make an additional one. Uh, first of all, uh, it was about the, and it's in the, it's in the report as well, um, about the interpretation of uh, what the Code of Conduct actually is wanting to do. And it was suggested it would be done loosely. I think in terms of where there are serious cases, one would want to see this uh, being done fairly rigorously. Uh, secondly, um, we were rather surprised to find that in the Constitution, the community development officers were actually mentioned. And uh, of course, um, many of us would want to see the continuation of this code in, in operation. Uh, and we do support the idea that members should be able to discuss and uh, get things done through the community development officer. And I hope that we'll be, able to we'll be able to continue with that. The third point that was raised by one of the members was that um, they were very pleased with the, manage the case management system for council. Um, but there is, a, there is a difference between getting a response from the course the the, course ma the case management system and getting a result from the case that is being raised. And I think that really needs to be drawn to the attention of the responsible officers and, and the, the cabinet as well. Um, the fourth point I want to, to make as well is that I think it's absolutely rock solid essential that where we have decisions being made by independent members of the governance committee, that those, in those independent members are independent and can be sure, can, we can be sure that they're acting impartially when they are making their decisions. 
Uh, and so consequently, um, Mr. Mayor, um, I'm quite sure that uh, the Liberal Democrat group will support what is going on, what is being proposed, and uh, hope that the points that have been made by the Resources Committee will be uh, implemented and, and will be uh, sympathetically dealt with. Thanks, Councillor, uh, Councillor Annaway. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we're happy to support this report. I just want to make one small point about page 47, where it says there's a convention there'll be no political discussion undertaken in the presence of an officer. Um, that might make the job of group admin assistants a little bit more difficult. It'd be a shame if they had to keep leaving the room. There isn't always a clear distinction between a civic issue and a political issue. And sometimes you get political remarks made within <laughs> debates that are not themselves political. Um, so just a suggestion you might want to have a look at that sentence again. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wayne Davis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, surprisingly, as 19 years of a councillor, I've never had a code of conduct complaint. I know that some people will look shocked at that. Um, al also, uh, despite what people might think, I don't sit and read the Constitution every night, um, uh, even though I do know a, a lot of the things that seem to be in it. Um, but because I don't read it every night, I don't seem to know whether or not there's anything changed in there about the uh, ability for councillors to still approach officers of the council and that won't change. I know that it was mentioned about using the member uh, inquiries for email and, and portal, but as, a, as, as someone like me, I never use it, to be honest. I just go direct to the person who I, uh, who I know that will deal with it. Um, so as long as that's not changing and we can still do that, I'm absolutely fine. Um, but just to point out, um, as what Councillor Hannaway just said there, um, every decision that this council takes, every, everything that we work towards is probably political, so at what point do we argue that it's not political if we're in the presence of officers? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. I have uh, Steve Kay. Sorry. Thank you. Just, come on, Just to sort of streamline things a bit, I think uh, Craig has made an important point about this business of admin assistance not having to vacate the room when political matters are discussed, it's impossible. So I think, ca can we agree now to take that bit out of this recommendation? Because otherwise it's going to make it group, the handling of group uh, meetings is going to be virtually impossible. It's just ridiculous. That in the past, We've never had any problem with leakages or anything like that. Everybody knows how they have to behave. And I just think it's, it, it, it's asking for an impossibility. And we shouldn't be dealing in impossibilities. We should be practical. And that should be removed. And we should agree to, move it now, to remove it now. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, I guess there's two options in terms of Councillor Kerr's suggestion. So with the consent of the meeting, Councillor Massey could put forward a revised proposal that that um, paragraph is removed, or alternatively, if Councillor Massey doesn't want to do that, then Councillor Kerr could, could propose an amendment. The last sentence of the paragraph you'd need to remove. Uh, Councillor Chris Massey. Yeah, I think uh, I agree with the broad sentiments that are being shared by um, Councillor Hannaway and Councillor Davies. Um, this, I don't have a huge problem with the sentence because I interpret it a different way, but I understand that it could be interpreted the other. In effect, officers of the council shouldn't be involved in party political decision making, but obviously most decisions we reach in council can be political um, at times. So I think we just need can we just take the sentence out? Yes, I think that's the sensible suggestion, so thank you. <laughs> Ask the meeting to agree that Councillor Massey can take that out of the... Uh, thank you. Right. 
right. Oh, thank you, um, members, for the comments. I think it's quite a simple one. Um, Councillor Brown gives us the past history and the number of complaints at 83. Um, I think this lifetime of the council hopefully is a bit quiet and we won't get to those levels again. Um, on a couple of the comments, Councillor Nightingale mentioned the Resources Scrutiny Committee and the views of resources were discussed at the Cabinet. Um, I know you chair. I think I missed the meeting of resources and you missed the meeting of Cabinet, but we got there in the end in the sense that the minutes were shared. We discussed them. And this should be an organic document. It's something that can continue to be reviewed. It shouldn't be set in aspect. It's what works today, but that might not be what works in a month, a year, two years. So we need to keep it under review. And I'd welcome Councillor Nightingale and his committee continuing to do that along with governance. Um, we've talked about Councillor Hannaway and Councillor Kay's points, and we've dealt with that by removing the sentence, hopefully. Councillor Davies is correct, and I think that was the essence of Councillor Thompson's previous amendment prior to this meeting, which is in the pack. The members' inquiries is great for a lot of things. I use it a lot, but there will be times, as Councillor Thompson's amendment suggests, where we need to talk to officers directly. So by changing the language, it's not prohibited to do that. It's just trying to streamline arrangements for staff where possible, that if there's a simple inquiry, that members' inquiries might be the best place for it. But equally, we will have to deal with community development officers, democratic services officers, regularly, by name, by telephone, by email, directly. You can't go to members' inquiries to ask for something from Dem services, because we have a different relationship with that team. Um, so yes, I move the report, and yes, that's it. Councillor Massey, can I have a show of hands in agreement, please? That's, that's carried. On the agenda, would it be remiss to ask for a five-minute recess for members? Uh, after this, after yeah. this report. After this report. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Oh, sorry. Councillor Brown, do you want to second that? I'll second it. Yes. Someone here is going to second it. Yeah, yeah it's seconded. <laughs> <laughs> I'll second it. Um, so this is just our standard um, update report for the quarter on children in care um, that goes to the Corporate Parenting Board. It went to the Corporate Parenting Board uh, last week. It was a, a positive discussion, and uh, I thank uh, Captain King for, for sharing that. And in fact, just to add, an extra point that's unrelated to this really but about corporate parenting we've had the lda in uh, this week in conducting a peer review into our department as part of our journey that we've been on since uh, the administration began on how we continue to improve the service and make sure that uh, we're getting costs under control as well and one of the things they flagged was corporate parenting as a as an example of something that's really positive and uh, has and works really well so um the report for that will be published um, later on and, and there are lots of things in there to learn lots of things that are very positive but corporate parenting is one of them um, in terms of this report as I say it's our regular update report um, so I'm happy to move it and if there's any questions uh, I'm happy to take them Thank you Mr Mayor um, thank you Councillor Mayor for your report I sit on the corporate parent parenting board as you know so I hear firsthand all the, the great things that our officers do for our children in care. I do have one question, and that is on page 84, and that is where you talk about our needs, the children um, in care who are not in employment, in education, employment, or training. Now that rate seems to be 50%, which I think is, is very <coughs> high um, in my mind. There is no comparative data so it's difficult to make an informed judgment whether that 50% rate is good, whether it's bad, um, and that's maybe something you want to comment as well, comment on as well. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Councillor King. Thank you. Just a quick question. At the last council meeting, you agreed to work with me with the letter for ministers of children. So we've sent that letter over to you. Are you happy for that now to be sent? Yep. Thank you. Ah, if I have no more speakers, can I ask Councillor May to sum up? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So just to respond to those two points, uh, so, so on neat data analysis is something that 
came up the last uh, full council as well. Um, we are in line with the, the national average, um, and we're, we're confident in, in that, but I'm happy to uh, provide more detail uh, following uh, this meeting. Uh, in terms of the letter to the minister, I spoke to Richard yesterday, um, so yeah, that's, that's fine to go. Um, and just to sum up, there's a couple of points I wanted to flag, um, both from, from the report and also um, that have happened since. And in particular, I want to highlight um, one of our social workers, who I mentioned at the last full council, at Ben Chizanga in our uh, UAS team. Um, at the last full council, I said he'd been nominated um, for a national award, and we were waiting to see what the outcome of that would be. Well, last uh, week on Friday, um, we found that he'd won uh, an award. He, he was silver in the country for uh, social worker of the year. So uh, it's something we should be very, very proud of. Um, and there's lots of work happening across our teams in terms of uh, supporting children in our care that, that is just absolutely outstanding. And that's something the LGA uh, has been flagging to us this week. Um, that we should be very proud of the service that we provide. Um, there's a couple of other areas within the report uh, that we should be very pleased about, the progress that's being shown in terms of linking with the junction to offer more support um, for children in our care to have more of a voice within the system, within corporate parenting in particular. Um, our new exploitation team, which we mentioned at the last full council, which is uh, coming on screen now, which is uh, there to tackle the uh, criminal gangs that are exploiting uh, children and getting them uh, involved uh, in crime and antisocial behaviour, uh, and a range of other things within the report as well, but uh, happy to move the report. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Mayor. I can have a vote in acceptance of that report, please. It's it carried.
Right, can I call you all to order, please? Comes to agenda item nine, which is Councillor Ursula Hurl with a cabinet report. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, fellow councillors, uh, this is my first annual report to council as cabinet member for health and welfare, and for the first six months of the time period, the responsibility for that portfolio was held by Councillor Steve Kay, and many of the achievements highlighted in the report should be credited to his tenure. It's a great privilege for me to hold the portfolio. My working life was spent in the NHS, and the Council's plan to improve physical health and mental well-being are my priorities too, because I saw at first hand conditions such as cancer, ischemic heart disease, and obesity-related illnesses that are possible to prevent through effective public health engagement and individuals and communities. The remit of public health is to improve the health of all residents but we know that there is considerable health inequality across the borough, with a life expectancy gap of between the poorer and more affluent of about 12 years for men and seven years for women. Health inequality is driven by many factors, low income and poor quality jobs, poor education and attainment and lack of skills or training, poor housing, poor transport links and social isolation, disability and vulnerability. We know that many of those factors exist across the borough. We have lower median pay compared to other areas, a high level of economic inactivity, and man many of our children are growing up in, in poverty and in households where parents and carers work. In addition, the ongoing cost of living crisis that disproportionately affects those on low income and the long-term effects of the pandemic have increasingly challenged the council's ability to assist residents with service delivery. Nevertheless, the Council has redeployed resources to enable residents to receive the additional benefits to which they are entitled, provided safe and, safe, safe and warm places for people to meet, and delivered the Holiday Activities Fund places to ensure children are warm, safe and fed during half-term holidays. I'd now like to highlight some of the achievements and developments outlined in the report. Uh, firstly, to say that public health is a joint service with Middlesbrough Council, and it has secured significant external investment for services across South Tees, in addition to leading on the local pandemic response and health protection plans. So in response to the cost of living crisis, our improvement team, working collaboratively with welfare rights, ran two campaigns. The pension <coughs> credit campaign with £960,624 raised so far for those entitled to additional benefits. They also ran the Council Tax Support Campaign, which has netted an additional £14,573 from 26 cases. In addition, the team ran the Cost of Living Community Drop-In Events, which resulted in additional benefits claims of £18,000 and provided warm and well packs for those in need and access to emergency top up fuel vouchers. The team secured funding from Northern Gas Networks to run an affordable warmth project, Warm Homes, Healthy Children. The team secured micro grant funding from the Ballinger Trust to enable communities to develop local cost of living action plans, <coughs> and work is ongoing with Citizen Advice Bureau to deliver the Money Guiders programme. We have a changing future program. This is to support those with additional multiple vulnerabilities and public health has secured a total of over three million pounds from central government and the national lottery. To date, 533 people have been supported by enhanced key workers and key workers to access services such as domestic abuse support, mental health support, substance misuse support and debt relief. We have a social prescribing programme which has expanded to provide support to 17 GP practices across the borough. The programme 
uh, aims to help reduce inequalities and since October 2022, the team has received over 3,000 referrals, supported patients to improve their well-being and signposted others to specialist services and social care. The Waiting Well programme supports patients waiting for surgery to improve their health and well-being preoperatively. 88% of people participating thought the service was very good. Thrive is our integrated substance misuse and domestic abuse partnership, uh, which has been operating and developing in Redcar and Cleveland since April 2022. It supports people to make long-lasting lifestyle changes to improve their social and physical health. We do have statutory requirements under the Domestic Abuse Act uh, 2021, and an audit is currently in place to ensure we are meeting requirements and providing effective support to victims. We also have a statutory duty to commission or provide sexual and reproductive health services, and we commission the service in conjunction with other T's local authorities, our integrated care board, and NHS England improvements. The contract is awarded to HCRG Group, and the value of the contract, attendance figures for the service and outcomes are given on page 13 of the report. I'd like to talk about improving mental well-being. In particular, the Head Start programme. This was introduced locally in 2019 and is funded by Public Health to improve emotional well-being and resilience in school children across the borough. The team support mental health leads within schools, deliver support within schools to help pupils move from primary to secondary school, and also encourages children to build the skills to help others. 739 children award and 319 silver award and three of our local schools have achieved in terms of disease prevention we have a, a stop smoking service and we're seeing increasing numbers of people accessing the service and increasing numbers of people who've quit smoking we have a best start in life program with free work streams community reading champions in Loftus, uh, supporting breastfeeding, and our revamped family hubs are very, playing a very important part in this, and we have an Eat Well Schools Award scheme. We're tackling inactivity through the You've Got This Sport England funded programme, uh, and that's currently funded until 2025. My other portfolio responsibilities include housing and homelessness. Um, the team really strive to prevent <coughs> homelessness and demand for the service is very high. For two factors, we have a cost of living crisis and increased rents and we have landlords selling up and fewer rental properties available. We have rough sleepers in the borough and our rough sleeper numbers have increased but the team have secured £135,000 of rough sleeper initiative funding to help people get off the streets and into settled accommodation. We've made improvements to housing stock. Uh, we were part of a consortium that bid and received home upgrade grants, HUG1, to benefit 195 homes within the borough to achieve better home efficiency. We've now successfully obtained a second round of funding, HUG2, which has just become available. And we're supported by Cleveland Fire Brigade's free and warm scheme. Our trading, trading standards uh, team have had several notable achievements and are working closely with the Victim Care and Advice Service to stop doorstep crime and cost of living scams. Environmental Health continues to investigate food complaints and respond to food poisoning notifications. And in under culture and tourism, I'd like to highlight our borough hosting the National Road Cycling Championship circuit race in Redcar and the road race through Saltburn, Skelton, Boosbeck, Lingdale and Brotton. The road race was televised and viewers across the United Kingdom will have seen our beautiful countryside and coast Fantastic residents, myself included, and supporters on the route. Uh, it's the content of the report. Thank you for the report. It now comes to a question and answer session. Uh, Wayne Davis. 
Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor, um, and and thank you, Councillor Earl, for uh, presenting a, a, a nice report where you can read it uh, as well as the councillor. Um, I can't remember names now. The last one, anyway. Um, <laughs> sorry, apologies. Um, yeah, it was just a couple of things, uh, uh, Councillor Earl. Uh, thank you for attending the Loftus Ward NAP meeting. Uh, you were invited um, uh, to come along to the Loftus Ward NAP meeting in September, and we had the theme of health, um, and and you attended. Um, and hopefully uh, you were made welcome and, and you thought that the debate and the, um, the questions that were presented were informative and, and thank you as well for sending the requested information that you did send over and it has been presented to all the people that attended that meeting as well. Um, I'd also like to join you in thanking Councillor Kay for some of the work that he's done over the past year uh, for starting many of the projects uh, that have been started now um, over the last year um, on, on that were involved in your report. Um, but uh, lastly, uh, most of the projects that have been delivered uh, have been delivered through external funding. Um, I just wondered, for lay councillors like myself that don't attend adult services scrutiny, um, uh, for whatever, obviously for work reasons for me, but for someone else they might not get it, is there a way of us being able to see a breakdown of the funding that's been provided, the outcomes that have been delivered, um, and whether or not we can get that at ward level, uh, and if not at a borough level, uh, if that was more practical. Thank you. Councillor, Councillor Hurt. Questions actually have very well informed residents in Loftus. Um, so you, you would like to see more information about the funding uh, that we receive, the outcomes and the delivery, is that correct? Yeah. Um, Try and provide that information. Councillor Leroy. Thank you for the report. Um, I have a question with regards to 834 uh, and air quality. Uh, it's uh, your administration's policy to have um, to construct a huge waste incinerator to burn the entire north um, household waste in Grangetown. Um, is that tier six as well? So, swimming pool for poverty and, um, and, and uh, an incinerator for COPD, it appears today. Um, now, I have concerns over that energy recovery facility because the standards that were used were not World Health Organization standards, but lower UK standards, which have a higher concentration of fine particulate matter 2.5, which leads to COPD uh, associated diseases such as bronchial um, or COPD associated diseases. Um, so therefore the question is what's the cabinet members, bearing in mind that the cabinet member is also uh, a healthcare professional, um, what is the cabinet member's position on the energy recovery facility and does she share concerns like I do in terms of the respir future respiratory health of, of those who live around the Grangetown area as a result of this incinerator. Thank you. Councillor. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, two conditions, chronic bronchitis and emphysema, and both conditions are primarily caused by smoking. It's very difficult, in fact, to differentiate what environmental agents play in that as well but I can assure you that the, the cause of most cases of COPD uh, are related to cigarette smoking. Um, in terms of air quality, we have, uh, as to a council, we have to report our air quality, and we did that in June. Our air quality is good across the borough, and I'm very happy to provide you with a copy of that report, if that would help. My position on the incinerator is, my understanding, as with other council members who've attended all the briefings, are that it will not produce an environmental hazard in the area. However, um, it has not been built yet, I have to say, and everything will be scrutinised and monitored correctly. Thank you. Do you have a supplementary question? No. No, you're right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, 
Thank you, Councillor Earl, for your report. You have mentioned, and I have mentioned in this chamber a few times, regarding Head Start and how important mental health is within our children. And today we have raised this when we were discussing neurodiverse. Um, could you tell me which the three schools are? Now, I know Dormantown was the first one and the flagship, if you like. Um, who are the other two schools with the goal? And how close are other schools actually to you? Thank you. So, as you, as you know, Dormantown was one of the first of the three schools to achieve goal status. Um, Grangetown is one of the others, and St. Benedict's is the third. I haven't got the figures to hand about how many schools have silver or bronze, but I can get you those figures. But rest assured, um, I will be trying to push gold awards and push schools towards gold awards, such as my school in um, Boosbeck, uh, Lockwood School, where I'm a, a school governor, uh, because I, I do think this is really important. Um, Thank you so much for the support you've given me with that project. Councillor Annaway. Report. And for the wealth of detail and the wealth of information in this, one thing that doesn't merit very much attention is um, Section 5 on the Live Well South Tees Board, which used to have the more sensible name of the South Tees Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, we've got about a hundred words there. We've got three themes that it's working on, and then uh, um, three bullet points uh, on what the key workers see, um, which, as usual with the with that board, doesn't contain the word children. It was always very hard to get children's issue on the agenda of the board. If you compare that section to, for example, um, the one on the pension credit campaign where it says you know, exactly how many people have been helped and how many assessments were made and what, what the financial implication is. The one on the Live Well board looks very thin, which does rather confirm my impression from being on the board that it's just a talking shop. And I can't think of anything they achieved in the four years I was on it. Um, so I wondered if you agreed with me on that. Um, and if you do, will you undertake to try and shake them out of their semi-moribund status and make them do something, please. Um, I've, I've attended two of the board meetings so far. Uh, we do discuss a lot of things. Um, so, for example, at the last board meeting, we were discussing vaccination rates, and we were discussing our vaccination rates in Redcar and in Middlesbrough, and our vaccination rates are uh, probably lower than they should be. Uh, and I suggested that we made that one of our priorities to actually get our vaccination rates up to protect children. Um, and I'm particularly interested in uh, papillomavirus uh, infections and vaccination against papillomavirus in teenagers. We've also had presentations on um, brain anatomy and brain development. Um, so children, children are discussed there. We are interested in children. We also feed in in the new um, in the new NHS management structure that we have. The Live Well South Tees Board feeds into the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment, which the North Eastern Cumbria Integrated Care Board do. So, in in a in a sense, the needs of local people do get fed up, so that we can prioritise resources that come down. So a think it is just just a talking shop. I've only been to two meetings. Um, I will take your word on board. Um, I will try and stir up the discussions at times because, you know, health is my interest. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mayor Young. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you for a very comprehensive uh, report uh, covering a very wide area. Um, my concern is uh, round about um, emotional wellness and isolation and um, increasingly um, I find residents are being pushed along the line of having to become digitised otherwise they were going to lose their phone services etc etc 
and for those who find it increasingly difficult to function in this sort of um, world, <laughs> we used to have lots of programmes within the libraries and, and things ab about um, learning how to use your digital equipment and perhaps even providing it. Um, I would like a little bit more information on that and also the assurance that for as far as possible we will still be trying to contact people by other means, i.e. hard copy of things and notices, um, because it's not just the elderly, it's uh, people who are vulnerable or um, just don't have the capacity to take all of this on board. So if you could just keep me up to date with that, I'd be very appreciative. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Evans for that. Um, yes, social isolation. And I thought you were going to mention the buses. Um, and I thought you were going to mention the X3A and the 5. And the fact that we have an awful transport service in East Cleveland. I, it is so sad. I spoke to a lady about two weeks ago who's not going to church any longer because she can't get the bus up there. And, and she, she told me she's putting money aside so that the money that she put, would put in the collection, she's giving it to a friend to take up to church. But, you know, that was, that was for her, it, that was a real social outing where she had a community. Uh, I, I absolutely despair because social isolation is so bad for people's health. And you are absolutely right that we're marginalising people, it increases the health inequality when they can't access the internet, when they can't get a T-Splex bus, for example, because they haven't got a smartphone to use the app. And when you, when you phone up T-Splex, then you have to create a, an account, uh, and then you have to ask whether they take money on the bus or whether it's just, it, it is, it's not designed to be helpful for people. So I will take on board what you've said about you know the libraries and what information we provide, what training we provide for people, not just in our libraries but in our community hubs as well, because our, our community volunteers are absolutely wonderful in what they what they deliver. But yes, I take social isolation very very seriously, and we have communities who are cut off in East Cleveland after about seven o'clock at night. It's not good for young people. It's not good for the elderly. It's not good for working people either. So thank you very much for that question, Councillor Henry. Thank you. Councillor Carolyn Kerr. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I was going to ask a question um, about the Live Well staff people as well. My question was around, I'm assuming it's classed as an outside body, and I know we are supposed to be uh, getting feedback from outside bodies. I know we're not there yet, um, but I, and I know I sit on the adult um, scrutiny and we haven't had any feedback, certainly since May. So I'm wondering, Councillor Earl, if you could maybe um, change that up for us. I didn't know the board was moribund. Perhaps if it were reporting into the, or at least feeding back to the adult um, scrutiny, it might become less moribund. And I have one other point for May. I, I was really taken with the reading for well-being in Loftus, and I'm wondering if we can roll that out further across the borough. Thank you, and thank you for your comprehensive report, please. <coughs> Live Well South Tees Board. Um, I attend the board. Um, uh, Councillor Brown attends the board, um, and Councillor Belshaw attend the board. So we can certainly bring back not, not the whole minute, please not the whole minute, but perhaps, you know, some very um, pertinent features. And that can also be brought back, I think, um, to children's scrutiny, if the chair of children's scrutiny would like to have that as well. I don't think that's a problem. And in terms of the reading, um, I will find out who the best contact is for that um, and let you know. Thank you, Councillor Barry Hunt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for your report, and also thank you to Councillor Kay for the work he did for him when he was here. Um, it's about sleeping rough, and, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm bullish, nobody should be sleeping rough, but um, there's many different people sleeping rough 
for different reasons. But my main, my big concern is our service mix. And um, there's so many people who have given so much for us, not, not by, you know, I mean, they go and fight, they go and they, they, they defend the country, and then they, get, they come out. And there's so many people with mental health issues, s service people. And what worries me, we, we ask the government, it's, it's a big problem. Do we get enough, do you think, help from the military itself, who put these people, who train them, and then dis, dis, you know, just disregard them when they've gone? Do, do we as a council get any help from the, from the military themselves? I know the government have the purse strings and everything, but the military are where these people have worked and been, some of them been in there for a lot of years, and then they come out. And, and it, it's so sad to see the, the, the military people. You know, I, it breaks my heart to see them after they've given so much. Every, nobody should sleep rough. Everybody should have a, a, a bed and a home. So uh, I just wondered if, if we do get enough help from the actual military. Thank you very much, Councillor Hunt. Um, I can't answer that question directly, but I will find out. But I absolutely agree with your sentiments. Uh, you're right, veterans are one group that sleep rough. People with substance misuse, another group. People who found themselves homeless because they simply can't pay the rent anymore. Family breakup, m mental ill health. There are so many factors that lead to people sleeping rough. It is not a lifestyle choice. It is a crisis and we need, we really need to address it. Thank you very much. But in response, I will try and find out about uh, what links we have with the military and whether we could actually develop more links with the military. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Neil Hargreaves. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I was going to ask about the Eco Flex scheme. So the last stage of the scheme gives the opportunity for people with low-income low families under 31,000, I think it is, to um, get funding for uh, insulation and things like that. Uh, on doing a bit of research, it seems that this local authority is a bit slower than others to put their statement of interest out. Um, can you confirm that was the case? And can we, can we look into why that was and why we weren't fresh off the ball and doing it a bit quicker? Thank you, that's my question. Thank you very much. I don't know the history of uh, when we bid for that and when we got the scheme um, up and running, I'll have to refer back to officers and give you a written uh, report on that. Is that okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that report. That's the end of that session. Uh, we have no motions, uh, but we have uh, three, one, two, three, four uh, items to appoint members. Can I take it as read and take a vote on block, please? Can I have a vote? Right. Uh, we'll now come to... Can, yeah, can I have a vote that we accept those uh, members' things? Can I have a vote? Hands up, please. Carried. Uh, we now... Um, <coughs> Councillor Pallister, um, Bellway Homes paid the council 30,000 on the 27th of September to contribute towards the replacement of the dilapidated clay park in Skelton. Can I ask the council to confirm that the 30k fund is being ring fenced for this project? Can I also ask if the council will be making any contribution, and if so, what that figure will be? And lastly, when does the council intend on starting the project? Because the community um, will certainly benefit from that if it's delivered before spring. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Councillor Thompson. I can confirm that the council has now received the funding from the developer on the 27th of September. The 30,000 funding is ring fenced through the 106 legal agreement for the upgrade of the children's play space 
adjacent to the development site. Further to the 13,000 initial funding, I can confirm that the Council is in discussions with the developer to secure additional funding to enable the ongoing maintenance of the park over the coming years. With regards to Council contributions, I know that the Ward Councillors, Councillor for Skelton West, Councillor Ursula Earl, and Councillor John McHugh have been working closely with the Cabinet Member for neighbourhoods to consider options around how best to maximise the use of the funding. I think before the, you've, you've asked for a start date, but before the project starts, the Ward Councillors for Skelton West want to ensure that the local schools and the community are involved in the design, so that might take a bit longer to make sure that the community get the best use and, and what does what does get developed is what the community want and um, so the time scale I can't give you. Councillor Thompson do you have a supplementary question? Um, just lastly really it's about engagement and the Skelton Park is a Skelton amenity and so I'm a little bit confused why only the Labour comes to us the Labour councillors are being engaged in that process and the Conservative councillors are being pushed to the side. Can we have a commitment that the project is discussed across all councillors within Skelton? Councillor Pallister. Well, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure the ward councillors for Skelton West are more than happy to involve all councillors. My um, information is that the, the actual park is in their ward, which is why they've had a lot of involvement with the, count, the cabinet member for neighbourhoods. So I'm sure the three councillors are more than happy to in, involve all the other councillors in the development, as well as the most important people, the wider community, the children and the residents. Thank you. The next question comes from Councillor Julia Hart to Councillor Myers. Hello. Uh, hi, Lou. Um, the Local Government Association is calling for a greater financial oversight of the biggest independent children's care providers following a report it published last week that found that they'd made over 300 million in profit in the last year. It comes as councils face significant financial pressures in children's services um, and we know that here. Um, due to the rising numbers of children needing increasingly expensive care, expensive care um, I refer to the Cabinet Papers on the 24th of October um, with the attached reference number that you've all got in front of you. Um, the decision was made to award a Gloucestershire company a contract to provide emergency social care for one child um, of a contract for 14 weeks at a cost of £14,481 per week, which is a total of £102,742. The contract also contained an additional element of up to £2,660 for that time in travelling and subsistence. Subsistence. Um, could you please tell me uh, why have we not been able to meet this child's needs locally and in a more cost effective way? And what measures are being put in place to ensure a value for money for both our children and our council care? Why also is an emergency package of care for 14 weeks? Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for the question. Um, it's not quite accurate, I'm afraid. It's uh, the provider's head office is in Gloucestershire, but the placement itself was within Greater and Cleveland. I'm happy to say, uh, and it's positive to be able to report that this vulnerable young person with complex needs is no longer in this setting. They were there temporarily, and because of the good work of that provider, they're now back in a stable uh, residential home. Do you have a supplementary question? read those figures that we would spend that money so the um, my statement still stands there 
but I commend the officers if they have reduced that 14 weeks down. I would also like to bring up um, that given travel expenses is already under scrutiny with us in the children's department, um, how could we justify an extra £191.90 a week? Thank you. Councillor Myers. Uh, thank you, Councillor um, Hart, for the uh, question. Uh, so in terms of the uh, travel, um, that particular element of that uh, placement was for an apprenticeship that this young person was uh, taking part in. Uh, and so that was to cover both the living costs, but also for them to undertake that apprenticeship and get into uh, that opportunity there. And so they're paid on actual costs um, up, up to the maximum within that piece. And so we're very proud, actually, that we're offering those kind of opportunities to those young people and making sure that um, once they are leaving care, they're able to get out into the world of work and progress uh, into the future. And that's something that we hope that all of our young people uh, are able to do as well. Third question is from Councillor Grogan to Councillor Brown. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, last week, I attended the Red Car Hydrogen debate to hear the negative sides and views of the use of hydrogen within residents' homes. The trial areas are Kirkleatham, Dormanstown, but prim primarily, I'll put my teeth in, <laughs> primarily there is uh, Cawtham and Zetland. Uh, unfortunately, a number of key players were missing, including NGN, which is the Northern Gas Network, who declined the invite on this occasion because their claim, due to misinformation from, and I put in inverted brackets, independent experts, that have been given to residents. I felt genuine questions were raised, and I feel members need to ask more of NGN in order to try and reassure re residents. Would Councillor Brown, which I know he has done on his own social profile, agree to invite NGN to attend any, a future meeting with Council to answer questions from councillors in a more formal meeting where minutes can be taken of the session and released for public knowledge. Councillor Brown. Just for clarity, uh, Councillor Grogan, your question doesn't mention the Council? Just, just in your word on there a little bit. Uh, is it? Oh, uh, sorry, let me reread that. Sorry, I misread it then. Uh, I'm looking at the wrong question for a start. Yeah, uh, I don't need that answer. Uh, but, oh, from my understanding, if the, there wasn't any pro voice hydrogen uh, people at that event, so it was an against event, not a debate. Uh, however, Councillor Carl Quartermain attended by the, the team, reported back to me and Councillor Richardson, who was the lead member for this. And so, if in the future, if we direct questions there because she just whispered in the ear why is he asking you this <laughs> uh, 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 but but what we did do off the feedback Carl Lynn Rin have worked closely with all the all the residents of Cawtham and uh, I've not had anybody mention me from Care Cleatham however uh, other than the arm houses which were, were removed from the trial because of the the uh, age and the, not being sober for the trial after that feedback you're very right there was a lot of questions asked and uh, both me and Carrie and Carl and Lynn uh, and Mary and Councillor Fairley uh, wanted to fill that vacuum and so me and, me and Carrie immediately asked NGN for a meeting the following day which they duly accepted and what they did uh, what they, they did say they would hold an event with an independent chair okay uh, for, so, because if they were just to hold an event it would be very much look like it was just an industry uh, to the to the residents, uh, they give fair information, as you probably know from the briefings. Uh, what, I'm, what I'd be happy to do is get us another briefing for members in the council, additional to that event. Okay, that is going to be uh, going to be held with an independent chair, which NGN have kindly uh, accepted to do. So, thank you for raising it in the chambers, Councillor Grogan. Do you have a supplementary question? Yeah, basically. I'm going to be honest with you, hydrogen is one of the most abundant substance, substances and atoms in the universe, and it will play, I feel, a future role in sustainability, especially with new technologies growing around. And I do support the trial, but not at the expense of health and safety, which has been massively brought up. I do agree it was negative at that meeting, but we have been pro-positive meetings as well. So to get a balanced view on all this, I do believe so. Um, so like I said, you, you stated on a, 
on a Facebook thingy that you asked the MP to take a lead on it. And I believe, obviously, you are the leader of this council. I believe you should also take a lead on this as well to show true leadership. And I know. <laughs> I know that you're saying it's all under the government, but I think that your voice is the voice of this borough. You should be also leading it also. Councillor Brown. Uh, I think you've already alluded to taking the lead on it by my social profiles and said that I already had, uh, and I had for the residents. Uh, I agree, it is a bit of a joint, but it's not a council trial. Uh, so I'm, I, I would say with the debate and the people, the anti against, the only person or voice I've seen in any of them groups is mine. So I would ask you to take that feedback, which I 100% agree with, and ask the MP area who's now a minister and part of the decision-making body to relay back. It's not fair on the residents that are getting, thinking the rousers are gonna blow up with, with hydrogen, We're, even though the health and safety executive would never allow that, and we both know they wouldn't. It's unfair that Diniz and the government are letting these residents live with the anxiety month after month after month after month the decision was going, supposed to come in the summer, then it was the early autumn. We're now in November, and I'm being told it's probably going to be January or February. So I absolutely agree with your sentiment. I would say that the mass, mass the only voice they have heard, because they certainly haven't heard the MPs. So if you could take that back, I would very much work with Jacob and make sure that these people have no more anxiety. The pot. Fourth question is from Councillor Kerr to Councillor Bruce. Um, am I addressing it to who am I addressing it to? to oh, thank you, thank you, um, Councillor Brown. I would like to ask you what's happened to our bin service. You are presiding over a shambolic service, at least in parts of Gisborough. I don't think you realise how the service has deteriorated um, in recent weeks. For example, I have a resident, one of many, whose green waste was last collected on October the 6th. It was due to be collected again October the 20th. And since that date, she has been asked to bring the bins in, put them out, in, out, in, out. Nobody wants to, <laughs> hey, wait. Nobody wants to do the hokey cokey with their wheeler bins, councillor. So what I would like to know is what are you doing to remedy the situation and when can we expect service levels to be anywhere near where they should be? Thank you. Councillor Brown. Uh, councillors, before I read out, read out the written response you were going to get, okay, okay. councillors of a certain age or experience, uh, the, uh, Tristan, for instance, who was here many years ago, uh, well, not that many years ago, sorry, I'm being unfair there, Tristan, uh, will we'll remember a fully funded council, will remember before a hundred million pounds was taken from this council by the Conservative government. Tristan will remember when we had 1,500 more staff than we do today, okay? So what, what I'm going to do is apologize to the residents the the, uh, the dis disruption in normal service. However, when you've had 13 years of conservative cuts, it leaves a service vulnerable to COVID, which lots of our people and residents are getting at the moment. One of the councillors is not here today, okay? So you can be rest assured that we are, I'll, I'll, I shall read this out if you want, but I'm, I'm not going to. Uh, you can be rest assured as soon as the staff that we do have left, get well, they'll be back delivering your, uh, picking up your bins. I think you promise. And if you have a, 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 an issue where they're not, please do email me direct. All right? Thank you. you have a supplementary question? Please, Mr. Mayor. I understand our residents do pay to have their bins collected. It's called council tax. Okay? And something else you might want to consider is shelving any plans you have to charge extra for green waste, unless you are confident that you can deliver the service. Thank you. The next question is from Councillor Salvin, again to Councillor Brooks, and I think Councillor Brown is answering. 
Yeah, and firstly, I'd like to thank you for answering this, Alec. I know we had a bit of a hoo-ha yesterday, but yeah, you're a bigger man. Uh, anyway, the government published the Antisocial Behaviour Action Plan back on 27th of March this year, which sets out the government's approach to tackling antisocial behaviour. This includes new approaches which will give the police and crime commissioners, local authorities and other agencies tool to tools to tackle antisocial behaviour. The pilot scheme involves high visibility, uniform patrols and specific micro hotspots which, are, which have been identified in three wards within Regford and Cleveland as having a high level of antisocial behaviour. Areas linked to the nighttime economy were not included in this pilot scheme. Cleveland Police were given £2 million to be used by March 24 and were consulted early in the process. Their capacity for additional overtime patrols was limited given their existing overtime commitments. So local authorities were approached. It was agreed that capacity was available to undertake these hotspot hot patrols using existing local authority staff on overtime and recruiting new staff for the duration of the project. The aim for these patrols is to be done on foot three times a day, every other day, with two officers in attendance. Back on the 13th of September, the PCC's office got in touch with ward councillors from Normanby, which is my ward, Kirk Leven and Southbank with regards to the pilot scheme being introduced in the Cleveland area. The areas included in the scheme were Spencerbeck, my ward, Rosebury Square, Greengate Field and Ayton Drive in Kirkleven Ward, as well as the area surrounding Tesco, McDonald's and the old Eston Bath in Southbank Ward. Stockton, Middlesbrough and I failed to put in Hartlepool councils started patrols through August with enforcement officers encouraged to engage with residents and businesses as well as undertake enforcement actions including fixed penalty notices. Um, the intelligence and the information gathered from these patrols is shared between agencies via regular briefing sessions with the aim of reducing antisocial behaviour in these areas and improve public confidence in police and enforcement services. Uh, we're now in November and still nothing has happened in Redcorn and Cleveland Council. Can Redcorn and Cleveland Council confirm when hotspot policing patrols will commence? Are we uh, talking about police? Or the, the the wardens coming from the funding, Paul. Just for clarity, it just says policing on here. That's all. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, by all means, I will read out the written response, which is, uh, which is, uh, explains and answers your question. But but, you know, to, to to get the impression out to the public that it is the police that you, you know really really should be sort of any social behaviour with support of the with support of the council. Uh, so I wh whilst. I appreciate hotspot data has been analysed and highlighted by the Police and Crime Commissioner. It was done by the one before him as well, and the antisocial behaviour levels just rise and rise and rise. Uh, the amount of police officers we lost in Redcorn and Cleveland, I think, was over 500 uh, through cuts. Uh, so I appreciate your frustrations. Just to just to talk about touch on what me and Councillor Brook have done. In the last two months, we've met inspectors that covered the neighbourhood team for TSX and come up with a strategy. I can't give the operational information here today, but the operation will probably is already happening this week and also will be happening next week with the police. So we, we as council and cabinet, we've been working with the police to ensure that certain areas of TSX are uh, targeted uh, for a number of things, and it's also be every motorbike, drug dealing. Uh, but again, I can't give the information to the public thing because it's operational. We don't want it on, on, out on the streets. To uh, read what Adam would have said, Red Queen Cleveland, alongside neighbouring boroughs, were approached by the Police Crime Commission's office to look at provision of anti-ASB patrols in key areas of the borough, including Low Green, Spencer Beck, and the area around Rosebery Field, which is my own ward. Uh, the discussion with the Police Crime Commissioner office, Red Queen Cleveland, with Red Queen Cleveland, did advise that we were in the process of recruitment. And once back up to the full operational strength, we will be able to start the patrols. We were not only we were not the only authority that needed to recruit. It was agreed that both Middlesbrough and Stockton would start their patrols under a pilot as soon as possible, and we would commence as soon as staff were recruited and trained. We now have recruited additional team members, and they are currently in training, and we will be starting patrols by the end of November. At all times, the PCC's office the PCC's office, sorry, uh, have been aware of our progress 
and it has been understood that we would only be able to start these patrols when we had sufficient staff to deploy. The t team are committed to the project and continue to engage with the Police and Crime Commissioner Office and comply with the, the requirements of the grant funded. Do you have a supplementary question? I do, I do, Mr Mayor. And a few facts of my own. The government report published on the 25th of October said this, targeted uniform patrols in hotspot areas have helped drive down antisocial behaviour by 30%. Since rollout across 10 areas, obviously one that I, I was not one of them, there have been over 250 arrests, 600 stop and searches, and around 1,000 1, other enforcement actions. As a matter of comparison, from Blackpool, Lancashire Constabulary reported last year that antisocial behaviour uh, in comparison to this year is down 36%. Staffordshire Police across five targeted areas antisocial behaviour down 20% and in Redcar and Cleveland, well we'll never know because nothing's happened yet. All we get from Labour is their special brand of negativity characterised by a recent social media post from Labour's prospective Redcar candidate attacking the PCC for political gain. In a sponsored Facebook message last month she wrote, tell Tory PCC Steve Turner to keep our communities safe. To answer that, he has. He's given this council, led by Labour, the tools to do just that with this extra funding. As the Labour candidate for Redcar, does she not realise that this is her own party's failures within this council that have delayed vital funding from being used in hotspot policing to do exactly that, keep communities safe? Finally, how much additional funding might, me, might we as a council have lost because of Labour's political agenda? And if this goes on, I worry that we're in jeopardy of losing all this money full stop. So my supplementary question is, Redcar and Cleveland Council have completely failed to implement this project. Has this council prioritised Labour's politics over public safety? Councillor Brown. So I applaud it. He, he missed best regard Steve Turner from the bottom of that. <laughs> Everybody knows who's wrote that. Come on, Paul. Yeah, okay. Everybody knows who's brought that. And, 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 and all these anti soapers you don't think, sent here 20% there, 20 under the last game Labour government, when we had police forces, when we had bobbies on the beat, when we had police officers, we were nowhere near that. So, as I've already answered your question before, that, which was fine, that was good, because, yeah, we should have wardens on the street, and we will by the end of the month. The rest of it, with political jargon, just like Simon Clark's, stop bringing their bids into this chambers. The right and the stuff for you guys. Stop it. Uh, 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 Mr. Mayor. Um, it's just a, a, a request about safety, really. I just need to give you a bit of background information just regarding the e-scooters, which is quite hard to find uh, the legal uh, stuff behind it. But generally with e-scooters, the maximum speed is 15 and a half miles per hour. E-scooters are limited uh, in some areas and only trial in certain areas too. You must have a driving license to ride a, an e-scooter, so it should only be rode by adults. Um, you should also have insurance as well and the adequate uh, protection such as uh, helmets, uh, high visibility uh, and your lights as well. So every day I'm in my ward and over recent weeks I've seen a significant rise in e-scooters in the area by adults and young children. While the e-scooters aren't illegal to buy or sell, they are illegal to use, especially on pavements. The e-scooters I've seen are two or three people on them at the same time adults collecting with children from school. I've seen driving at speed at night with no lights on, weaving in and out of traffic with several near misses. I personally come out of a building the other night and no boy no older than 11 literally within a split second nearly drove into me. Now, I don't know who would have come off worse really. 
There are forced to be a real danger on the streets and in people's homes, especially with a fire brigade really concerned over the dangers that the batteries used to uh, cause the house fires. With Christmas coming up and people adding to the Santa Claus list, with the adults taking up e-scooters with no experience on the road and with the darker nights coming uh, with no lights on and the increased risk in the communities. So it's just a simple request if the council will help raise the awareness with the e-scooters uh, by social media pages, signposted, um, and enforcing, help enforcing the laws on this, and working with the yeah, police and other councillors for safety. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Good question, uh, Councillor Taylor. Uh, as a father and someone who sees them flying past, exactly the type of stuff we should be dealing with in this chamber. Good question. Uh, I'll, the, the simple answer is yes, of course we will. But I'll, I'll read out. Uh, the, what you would have gone. E-scooters are classed as a motor vehicle under the Road Traffic Act, which means the rules apply to motor vehicles also apply to e-scooters, including the need to have a license, which you've already, which you've already said. Uh, in area where trials are still in place in other boroughs across the country, rental of scooters includes minimum age, impro appropriate license, and uh, creation of an account, and they are solely uh, for use in approved areas. It is worth noting that the trials have been completed and now have been extended to March 2024. It is agreed that many private users will not necessarily be aware that if they uh, cause serious harm to another person whilst riding these scooters, the incident will be investigated the same way as a motorcycle or car incident, and that the penalties and offences exist riding without insurance or riding <laughs> on pavements or using any mobile device whilst riding. So the simple answer is yes, there yeah, we will. Do you have a supplementary question? Yeah, question 7 is from Councillor Joy, Akin, Councillor Brook, answered by Councillor Brown. Thank you, Mr. Nair. Um, thank you for taking the questions, Councillor Brown and uh, Councillor Brooks' absence. Open Democracy published research on waste incinerator or energy recovery facilities, or ERS, to ease of use, on June the 17th. ERS were exposed as releasing more carbon emissions than coal powered fire stations. Power stations, not fire stations. <laughs> That's why I'm thinking fire stations. Um, the council's project for a massive incinerator is in to be in an area where COPD and respiratory illness is in the top, top, top five in the country. In addition, in 2022, Dormanstown, which obviously is downwind of Tees Works, has the worst air quality in the UK. Um, uh, to um, to Councillor Earl's. Um, talk earlier, it, the, the, we know that it's not a contributory factor, but it can exacerbate, so we know there's exacerbations in symptoms. The UK government is now considering such in, uh, incinerators in England, after bans in Scotland and Wales, um, that don't have carbon capture fitted. The Grangetown incinerator, which has been granted planning permission and appears to be supported by the Cabinet, we will be without sign, filter and capture carbon capture technology for at least three years. So Open Democracy also revealed that incinerators offer an incentive to burn and are associated with lower recycling figures. Um, Grangetown recently was revealed to have 58.5% con contamination rates of waste submitted for recycling. So what has the Cabinet member done to promote an increase in recycling rates since taking um, his portfolio um, in May? Thanks, Brown. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, well, first of all, we inherited a 26% recycling rate under the last administration. It was 41% when you was with the last administration came in, in, in into power. So that's what we've inherited. Uh, recovering energy from waste only takes place after recycling and is therefore complementary to efforts to reduce, reuse and recycle as much as possible. I can reassure members that flue, gas, flue gases released from the flows plan will be subject to a robust cleaning and monitoring process to ensure emissions remain within the regulatory limits. By the way of reference to a comparable facility, the Wilton 11 Energy from Waste Facility treats approximately 450,000 tonnes of residual waste each year, and the air quality of the surrounding area has not been adversely affected since it began operating in 2016. Waste management and recycling is also a key focus of the Climate Change and Environmental Scrutiny and Improvement Committee, who have received a presentation on proposals to improve, improve recycling and will be given ongoing updates on progress. And also, to say you may have seen some unpopular press where we looked at the uh, retagging of recycling bins that are contaminated. 
Uh, it's not a popular thing, but we've targeted certain areas in, uh, I believe it's South Bank so far, and, and we're looking at other areas. It's not a popular thing to do. I remember Stephen Kerr pointing out the bin when we did it back in 2017 on the front of the Gazette, but we are striving to try and uplift the recycling rate. Okay. You have a supplementary question? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, appreciate that we all want to support our residents with recycling rates. We all want to obviously create a sort of um, good economic conditions, but also we want to develop preventive ill health. So with that in mind, can, can the Cabinet and, and yourself, um, Councillor Brown, commit to keeping this at the top of the agenda to make sure it, it's sustainable and keep net zero in, but is also protective of the residents' health? Councillor Brown. I absolutely can. Uh, you, you may recall the, the last meeting, uh, I still said we were going to go with the 2030 net zero deadline and with, with the energy to waste on the, on the, on the horizon something we very much have to uh, push in agenda. Yes, we may answer these questions back as the administration, but we're very much about driving recycling up however we can. Uh, Councillor Royd against the Councillor Brown. Thank you, uh, Mr Mayor. So the development of South of Basque has, uh, has commenced. Uh, this is a joint partnership between Miller Homes and Taylor Wimpy. Uh, it was land owned by the West Midland Pension Fund, who then sold the land a couple of weeks ago to, to uh, foreign name developers. Um, one of the weaknesses in our S106 regime is that it leaves communities that are affected by these developments at a massive disadvantage. We have 1960s infrastructure in Mask. We have sports and recreational clubs that are on the brink. Uh, and we have, with, with the exception of 25k, which is, um, has been allocated under S106, thanks to John Lambert at the appeal, it was a parish councillor who managed this for us. Uh, we've got that 25,000 um, allocation to the leisure centre doesn't cover the roof, for example. We've got a falling in roof on that leisure centre, which, which needs some funding. Um, we've got a population that's going to grow about 30%. We need to occupy the, the children. These are all family homes. We wanted bungalows. We didn't get them. We wanted a range of housing. We ended up with three and four and five bedroom detached houses. I was pleased to see the council leader at Mask United over the weekend and supporting the Seasiders. And I thank him for his interest in, in Mask United. Will the council leader please assist us in calling on the three multi-million pound organisations mentioned to provide funding for mask sports, recreational clubs, the leisure centre and children's play areas, all of which require urgent investment and have been so far ignored by the developers and the fund. Councillor Brown. Well, first of all, hopefully earlier on, uh, the recommendation regarding the 500,000 for, for grassroots sports and things like that, we, we can address some of them things in there, so as our commitment to helping grassroots sports. I'm fully aware of the development and the current planning permission and the 106. Uh, it must be appreciated that the development was approved by the government's planning inspectorate on appeal after being initially refused by the council's regulatory committee. Before committing to anything in this chamber, Tristan, I offer uh, if we could have further dialogue in a meeting specifically about this so we could discuss things moving forward. Do you have a supplementary question? Um, the, in fact, the S106 regime was agreed before the appeal in consultation with the council, unfortunately, and it left a number of weaknesses within the appeal case, which I, I read as fundamentally weakening the case of the council against the developer in that instance. However, S106 is what I want to address here. There's an opportunity with a change in legislation from the central government to readdress the S106 regime and to look at something called a community infrastructure levy, but it has to be targeted in such a way that it will benefit communities. And that means that we need to radically change the way that we've done things in, in planning going forward. The S106 regime hasn't worked for the council. We haven't built enough council housing. We haven't had enough affordable housing. We haven't had enough sports, leisure infrastructure, electricity. So the question is, also we understand that one of the priorities has been laid out here in terms of recycling, but then another, absolute paramount principle of this council has to be to improve the development policy going forward of the new local plan 
So can I have the assurance from council leader that the local plan will be forward thinking rather than looking backwards so that we can avoid 1980s style developments like we're going to suffer in mask. Thank you. Councillor Brown. Uh, Tristan, you can be uh, rest assured you're going to be pivotable in writing the local plan with us. <laughs> uh, well, it'll be a, a, an all member thing. Plus, it'll save on questions for the next three years as well. Uh, so, you can be rest assured, thank you for your assurance that all parties, everybody in this room, again, will play a part in the local plan moving forward. Uh, Councillor Lee Roy again. Question 10. Corporation at East Works operates on the compulsory purchased area of the former steelworks plant um, south of the Tees. I went through the unaudited accounts of the SPDC for 2022-2023 and I think there's a 91 million liability highlighted as an asset on page 10 balance sheet of the latest accounts of the STDC as well as misplaced notes of 12 and 13. I'll add in here just a further sentence. I contacted the SPDC on two occasions and received no response. In fact, one of the responses they did receive, they mentioned a financial note. But when I asked for the financial note to understand why that 91 million asset was there and wasn't counted as a liability, they failed to produce it. So therefore, I'm asking for yourself as council leader to point out this potential inaccuracy you've specified as you on your role, as your role, or part of your role on the STDC. Councillor Brown. Yes. Uh, have you accepted? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so with regards to the STDC and their accounts, I have a, a concern because if you look at the Tees Valley accounts as well and you look at the debt that's building up there, it's probably running at around 210 million with 83 million pounds going to be added on this year. If we then look, and it was recorded as well in the, in the private eye, if we then look at the dividend structure about the way that this is laid out, it means that 90% ownership is with two private joint partners who will take the profit from the deals. But because of the dividend structure, the remaining 10% won't come to the public purse. This means that the debt that's building up can only be paid in one way, and that's going to be through the future taxpayer. So this mounting debt is a debt bubble which taxpayers here in Redford Cleveland will ultimately have to pay. Now, when looking into the rules of the morality, there's something called a precept there. Now, people in Mast and Loftus will be familiar with this because you see the precept from the parish council, but we'll also then see a precept potentially from the mayoral authority as well. So I'm asking you if you can please address this ticking time bomb and raise this at STDC so that there's no current way to pay off this debt as it stands and they need to readdress the dividend scheme with urgency. You want to say it for me? <laughs> no, I won't just say yes. Uh, funnily enough, I've looked into uh, some of this uh, myself. There is there is uh, functions in place to protect the public purse. Uh, something is it called a Kenko, the side a, a subsidiary company, where a lot of the burden of future liability is going to be led. Uh, I certainly wouldn't be sitting on a board uh, that would that would lead to millions and hundreds of millions of pounds uh, burden on the uh, taxpayer. However, I will uh, I will say yes to getting insurances, and I'll, I'm happy to update the uh, full council as well on on, my, on that structure. But the, there is there is fail safes in place, which was the, the exact questions I asked myself when I first took my seat. Uh, Councillor Thompson to Councillor Brooks. Yeah. Councillor Thompson, round again. In uh, February 2022, the main sewer in Catnam Car Park was broken into by workmen engaged by Redfern Cleveland Council with catastrophic consequences, necessitating the closure of the car park and construction of a new treatment plant to operate 
while extensive reconstruction was undertaken. No formal explanation has been provided to members as to how this incident occurred. Several requests were made at the time for a copy of the drainage layout supplied to the contractor and a copy of the method statement issued for the work. Neither were supplied or ever have been. When will the results of the investigation into what were the procedures for procurement and protocols for implementation be published? What actions have been taken to address any non-compliance? Has a procedural review to prevent any repetition of this type of incident been conducted? Councillor Brown. Uh, I mean, I mean, unfortunately, this is going to have to be just reading on the response, Councillor Thompson. Uh, the incident obviously predates the current administration. Good lad, Adam. Uh, but the intention remains to bring forward a report for members when possible. However, there is a currently a live claim against the council, and members will hopefully appreciate that given the potential for litigation, I am limited in what I can say publicly in response to the question. In the case that the information prejudice prejudices the council's position. However, I reaffirm that report will be brought forward when possible and from the latest updates. I am hopeful that we should be able to do that relatively shortly and will ask that the report covers the matters related in your question, Councillor Thompson. Have I stepped read the question, Councillor Thompson? I have. Uh, given the response that we are still now, November 2023, trying to resolve an incident in February 2022, it is uh, with some concern that that has not yet been resolved. I note that you are indicating that a resolution will be imminent. I hope that imminency will be still within this calendar year, because what I am concerned about is the costs, and that will be my supplementary question associated with the original. What are the liability payments that are going to be incurred by this council in respect of the catastrophe? And what revenue did we lose as a result of the car park being closed and loss of fee income? So these are very relevant, I think, and hopefully will be encapsulated in the report that you are indicating are going to be uh, provided imminently. Uh, yeah, thank you, Councillor Thompson. I'm, I'm disappointed because I, I, I just naturally know all the answers to all of them right now. However, I'm not allowed to say the education, but of course, I'll make sure we're Adam Brook, uh, up, update you as soon as possible and, and the full council on this, Councillor Thompson. Okay. Right, the last question, again from Councillor Thompson to Councillor Brook. The public toilets on the lower promenade at Saltburn are continually subject to closure whenever there is heavy rainfall. The unreliability of the availability of this prime public facility is not helpful, either to Saltburn residents or hundreds of thousands <coughs> of visitors. The inadequately constructed building is in need of radical refurbishment to prevent this ongoing out of order saga. Can a date be given when appropriate remedial works will be undertaken? Has the cost of this remedial work been budgeted for this financial year? Councillor Brown. Uh, no, I can't give you a date today, but I will certainly chase it up. Uh, once Adam's back for you, Councillor Thompson. Uh, the public toilets at the lower prom are of an acceptable construction. The toilets are lo uh, located against the cliff retaining wall as such. Following periods of heavy rainfall, rainwater accumulates behind the retaining wall and then finding the path of the least resistance and rainwater running through into the public accessible areas. Reviews and inspections to determine how to avoid these closures have been carried out over the last year through regular monitoring. The council need to be confident that any re remedial works solve the issue rather than make it worse. Uh, during these inspections, rainwater 
doesn't always lead to the public toilets making it difficult difficult to predict where and how remedial works can be completed. However, a solution is being developed to introduce increased internal drainage into the plant areas adjacent to the main retaining wall, taking rainwater into the new drains before affecting the public publicly used areas. Quotations are being developed to install these remedial works. The timescale is not yet available, but will be shared as soon as possible with the ward members. Uh, there are, oh, no, no, yeah. Do you have a supplementary question? I have, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Given that over two million visitors per year come to Saltburn, uh, and can be expected in the future similar to pre-COVID levels. I find that the response is disappointing, that we are unable to clearly identify what actions are needed to continue to provide this nominal service. And I feel that extra toilet facilities and extra capacity need to be considered, which can either be for opening hours to be extended or providing and providing additional toilet facilities, particularly in the Valley Garden. If we are going to meet the demand, I say that with interest, uh, from the two million visitors that we're going to be expecting in the town. Councillor Brown. Uh, I think we don't want extra toilets around our wards. Uh, I'm, not, I'm certainly not going to commit to anything else today, but with them numbers you mentioned, Councillor Thompson, maybe if we charge tourists to use the toilets like we do in Scarborough and Whitby, and then that would create a residual income, so then we can always maintain the toilets and, and uh, build additional ones. It's certainly something I would like to explore. Uh, I know wherever I go to, like Skegness, Whitby, or anywhere like that, you've got to to use the loo, uh, so maybe that's something I could work, or Adam Council Brook could work with what councils about maintaining so we can make sure the facilities are fit for the beautiful town of South Burnett. Thank you. I hope you haven't been watching the clock, everybody, but we managed to finish with three minutes to spare, and thank you all for attending. <laughs>